Good afternoon. My name is Erin Blankenship, and I have the great privilege of being the Interim Executive Director at the Florida Holocaust Museum. I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon for this special presentation. Today, January 27th, is the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau and has been designated by the United Nations General Assembly as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Before we get started, I want to mention that there will be a QR code at the end of this presentation that when you scan it, will bring you to a survey about this event. We would appreciate it if you took a few minutes to complete the survey as it helps us as we plan future events like this one. And now I'm very honored to introduce my friend, Helen Kahan. I've been so lucky to have gotten to know Helen and her family over the last year as we were able to interview her for Dimensions and Testimony. Her interactive biography will be available at the Florida Holocaust Museum later this year. But today, we are very lucky to get a preview by hearing Helen tell her story, as we also remember the millions of innocent men, women, and children who were murdered in the Holocaust. I hope that after you hear Helen's story, you will become a witness yourself, retelling her story or by bringing your family and friends to the Florida Holocaust Museum and supporting our mission. Thank you again for tuning into this special presentation. And without further delay, please welcome Helen Kahan. Hello, my name is Helen Kahan. Today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day. It is also the anniversary of the Auschwitz concentrating camp liberation. I am a survivor of Auschwitz, but by that day, I was in a different camp. I was moved to two other and then take on the death march through Germany. I am 98 and a half years old and Del Hell is still with me all the time. I speak about this topic because I believe that be people need to hear what it causes and what evil human being are capable of doing to other human beings. I hope through education, more and more people will stand up when they see when hate leads to. Antisemitism was the number one cause of hate crimes in the United States this past year. The only thing that gives me hopes is to see young, young people who speak up and work towards a brighter future with equal rights for people of religion, color, nationality, or sexual orientation. Equal rights for all human beings. History must not repeat itself. Thank you for listening to my story. I am a survivor of the most atrocious exterminally camps created by man in our generation in the 20th century. I survived Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, and the factories at Liebstadt. Hitler was an evil man. He, along with his followers, the Nazis, rose to power and used the swastika, a twisted cross, as their sign. They conquered country after country. They wanted to rule the world. They wanted to make the free people of the world 
their slaves. I was born in a small town in Romania in the re re region. region of Northern Transylvania. I was the oldest of seven children. At the end of 1930s, I had my first encounter with anti-Semitism. I was a youngster when I called, could. when I could not high enter, when I could not enter high school just because I was a Jew. In March 1944, Hitler's Wehrmacht with me, what means war machines and SS fascist groups marked into Budapest, where I was living at that time. The SS troops immediately started building up the ghettos. All the Jews had to leave their homes and live in ghetto. The ghettos were small, only a few square blocks of town surrounded by a fence and guarded by armed troops. Each ghetto had only two guarded gates to go in or out, out of. All Jews were forced to leave their home, ho homes and move in here. The family lived in very, very crowded conditions, three or four families in one small apartment. In the ghettos, they had no stores, no schools, no hospitals or anything else to do. Jews had little or no permission to leave the ghettos. Jews were made to wear yellow stars or of David or their, on their clothes. If caught not wearing it, they would be shot on the right there. The police and the courts went right along with this policy. Soon after they herded all the Jews, the Nazis started transporting Jews from the ghettos to Auschwitz. Auschwitz was the best known extermination camp. That means that most people that were taken to Auschwitz did not survive. They were killed in the gas chambers and then were cremated. Our only crime was that we were Jews. At the same time, the SS troops deported gypsies, non-testworthy Catholics, non-homosexuals, homo, homo, excuse me, non-transworthy Catholics, homosexuals, mentally and physically handicapped people, political prisoners, and other do so-called labor camps. To the transported, we were packed into cattle wagons with only standing space without enough food without water. We were locked into wagons with sick and even terminal ill people 
who died in the wagons. The dead were left with us in the wagons for the five days trip till the train arrived at Auschwitz. In the wagon with us was a wooden barrel to use for our bathroom needs. Naturally, the one barrel overflowed and the smell was horrible. There was not enough food to even feed the children. There was not even water to help those that fainted. At arrival, waiting for us, were lots of SS Nazi guard with big German shepherd dogs. It was a frightening scene to hear the loud barking dogs, the screaming Nazis who were rushing us out of the wagon. Immediately they separated us by sending women and children in one group and then the men into another group. Families were split. Next, Dr. Mengele made a speech. He told us that women will go to work to a nearby labor camp while men and strong youngsters will walk the few kilometers about eight about five miles to the camp. And with this, he started to indicate with his finger who should go to the left and who to the right. The one sent to the left would go by truck, but instead, they were taken straight to the big shower bath, where instead of getting water for a shower, they got gas. Within a few minutes, minutes, you could hear the big screams. The screams that I still hear a lot of time in my in nightmares. After the screaming stopped, I mean, after the people were dead, they made the other Jewish prisoners remove the hair and the gold teeth from the victims. And then they were cremated. Often, people found their own relatives among the dead. Again, their only sin was being Jewish. Jews were considered by the Nazis to be an inferior race. They were Jews or gypsies or some Catholics or a few others that did not agree with Hitler's politics. They were different from Hitler's superior police. I watched my mother go the left with her small children, my brothers and sisters. I wanted to follow her but a Nazi guard signaled me to the right with my two other sisters. My father too went to the right. I watched my grandfather, grandmother, uncles, aunts, and cousins 
neighbors and friends go to the left. From a transport of over 3,000 people, only about 150 were left for slavery to do the Nazis' dirt work, dirty work. My sister Miriam and myself, we survived, survived the humiliation, hunger, hard work, beatings, and the human treatment of the camps. We did agriculture and the road construction work. At the end of the war, we worked in an airplane part factory. My third sister, Sarah, who was only 15, became very ill soon before we were liberated. When the English army marched into Bergen-Belsen, the extermination camp where she was. The soldiers placed a red cross only on the foreheads of the ill people that they felt could survive. Sarah, my sister, realized what they were doing. She also realized that she did not get a cross. She was very weak, but alert enough to know to take blood from her own lips and made a red cross for herself on her own forehead and hoped to be saved. However, she did not survive. Another person who was with, was with her saw her do this and told me the story. From Auschwitz-Birkenau, we had to march six to eight kilometers to work every day. Passing by the main entrance to the camp. The entrance had a big saying, Arbeit macht frei. Work makes you free. Meaning that if we work, we will be free. Another Nazi, Nazi lie, another Nazi lie. While marching, the SS guards would make the dogs run after us. In the week, those who were not fast enough and could not keep up would literally be devour, devoured, devoured, devoured by the dogs, drawn to death. We had to carry the bodies into camp to be counted at the daily cross, Tzelapel, and then the body was cremated. My father worked in a coal mine in Essen, Germany. There he got very sick and collapsed. When he could not get up to work, he was actually beaten to death by a Nazi guard. My cousin, who was considered too slow at digging ditches for irrigation, was hit 
over the head by a Nazi with his rifle and died right there. He had to carry him, her body into camp. Another friend ran to steal some potato peels from the garbage because she was very hungry. She was shot in the head. I saw her falling down. Two men that tried to escape were caught. One was beaten to death. The second one was hanged in the middle of the camp and all the prisoners had to watch the hanging for punishment in, at night, in the middle of the night. About every week, we had sanctions, selections. This was when Mengele, nicknamed the angel of death, the same man who made the speeches at our arrival, would pick out the weak people for guessing, and he replaced them with new prisoners that came in on the newest transports all day and night from ghettos and places that Hitler's troops occupied. I'll share with you a case I witnessed at one of those selections. There were two sisters working with us. Mengele select one of the sisters to be cast. She was too weak to keep working. At that moment, the second sister lost her mind. She started to sing, dance, and act as if she was elsewhere. Of course, she was also picked up and taken away forever. We were treated worse than animals. We were awakened at three o'clock in the morning. The counting of prisoners took place outside in the rain or snow. Wine, wind or very cold weather, and it lasted until 5 a.m. Then we get out breakfast, we get our breakfast, a cup of black coffee. Then we get a march to work. This took till about 7 a.m. Here is where we worked the whole day. Then at 7 p.m., we'd start to march back to camp. Again, we, start, we stood on our feet outside for the count for the tech next two hours. We got our dinner, which consisted, consisted of a cup of soup, which was more water than soup. And our 200 grams, about eight ounces of bread for a 24 hour period. Soon after arrival at camp, we also lost our identity. We were tattooed on our arms with a number. I still have mine. 
My name is A7504 on my left hand. There it is. The Nazis tried to cover their atrocities. They even had a Red Cross delegation come to Auschwitz to prove that this, in fact, was a labor camp, not an extermination camp. At one of these visits, one woman, an inmate, stepped out and told the Red Cross people the truth. Of course, she was declared crazy and taken away. After the delegation left, she disappeared in the gas chamber. There were very few people in the Wehrmacht or SS troops that showed, our, showed any remorse or hesitation for what they were doing. I did have one experience that I will share with you. At the very end of the war, when we were marching still under SS command, evacuating from one place to another, marching 20 or 30 kilometers daily, my feet were covered with wounds, bleeding, and I was in terribly pain. This was in March, April 1945. It was still snowing and rainy and very cold. I had no shoes only rags, rags wrapped, wrapped around my feet. During the short stop, um, the sight of uh, the road, during a short stop on the side of the road, I, A German, a German worker stopped and asked me why I was crying so hard. Looking at him, I got so upset, tore my rags off the wounds and showed him my bleeding feet. Bleeding. My bleeding, bleeding feet. Bleeding. At that moment, he pulled his rubber boots off his feet and gave them to me. I insisted that I did not want a gift from a German, but he still left them there and walked away barefoot in the snow and the rain. I can assure you that those boots certainly helped my recovery a lot and even possibly saved my life. As in Schindler's List, one person can make a difference, even if only in a small way. I want to head with a hope want to end with the hope that such atrocities will never occur again. I hope that people will band together to stop in the new Hitler's, Mussolini's, Ayatollah Omeniti, and David Dukes of this word from take her over. I hope that peace will prevail 
I hope that the time has come when we realize we are only temporary visitors in this world and that we have an obligation to make this a better place to live for ourselves and for everybody around us. We have an obligation to educate our young and old people to look forward to the future by leaning, learning. by learning from our past. There were very few human survivors of the Holocaust. I am one of them. I had and still have a very important job now. I tell my story to remember what the world was like before so much was destroyed by evil. To share the memory of those that did not survive, to tell their story to children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, to all who will listen, so nothing like this will happen anywhere to anyone. There is one more lesson for all of us today. We should never underestimate our own ability, our own ability to repair the world. When we see injustice, we must speak out. Each individual voice does make a difference. I would like to finish with a quote from an old Jewish sage. He who saves one life, it is ever he saved the entire world. Thank you for listening to my story. And I hope we will do it and it will be peace in the future. Hi, Helen. My name is Jada Lugo. I'm the museum educator at the Florida Holocaust Museum. Thank you for sharing your story with us. After listening to your testimony, I have a question that the audience may have as well. Can you tell us about your experience after liberation? I was liberated by the Russian army. I was together with my sister Miriam and a few other women. Each of us had decided to make our way back to our hometown for one reason or another. My father told me before we were separated that we would meet back at our house after the war. I tried to keep my promise to him and worked my way back home. This was a very difficult and dangerous trip, but I had to do it. Right after liberation, I met a Jewish American officer who warned us to run away from the house where we were living in Germany because the Russian soldiers in town were playing to get drunk that night, mostly like while, while drunk, they were going to rape the women. That's what they did at that time. In conversation with the officer, I told him that I had relatives in Brooklyn, New York. I had memorized the address of the bedding store my uncles owned there. 
it was happened that the officer was from Brooklyn and knew the store and offered to take me to them. Had they, they been able or not, that would have known later. I did not accept this because I had promised my father to meet back at our home after the war. After a long trip back to Romania, I became ill and could not continue walking. I had high fever and had no strength. I had hospitalized, I was hospitalized and then sent to a nursing home for, for over six months because the hospital was bombed down and it couldn't, I couldn't go to a hospital, so they put me in a nursing home. It was a very difficult time to, for me, for my sister and for all the survivors. After recovery, I felt very alone. My father did not survive the war. Very few people I knew came back to our town. Someone introduced me to my future husband and was not deported, he was not deported to a concentration camp. He was made to do forced labor back, back home. He too was very alone and very, very decided to marry. My sister Miriam, who turned home with me and has become very ill. She now had tuberculosis but was able to recover. She also met another survivor. She and I, a double wed. She and I had a double wedding. It was a very sad wedding since we had no family to celebrate with us. As Romania became communist, it was very difficult to leave. I had many relatives in America, including a grandmother. She immigrated to the United States in 1934 and was hoping to get visas to bring, out, bring us out of the family. She was not able to do that before the war broke out. In communist Romania, unfortunately, having relatives in America was a serious problem. I was not able to communicate with them at all sometimes through some other people i would re receive a message that they are alive that was it by communist rules we were not allowed to talk about our life during the war what happened to us was to be ignored and forgotten we got no support from anyone and had to start life from scratch with no family and no support at all. Our suffering, our losses were ignored. After all, 
we were now lucky enough to live in communist Romania. And everyone is told we are equal and the must work for the good of the community. We had to believe what they said. No one is allowed to practice any religion. All business are owned by the government. The schools and all institutions are governed and run. But everyone is afraid of everyone else. So anyone can, de can denounce you and the secret police is everywhere. The secret police is called the security, the securitate in the Romanian. It is the equivalent to the KGB, which you are more familiar with. After many tries over the years, we got permission to emigrate. Our relative in America had paid off our freedom from R Romania and arranged to have several Jewish organizations help us in Italy and later in America. There was the Sochnut, an Israeli group that was helping diaspora Jews to go to Israel. There was Hayas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Nayana, the New York Association for New Americans. Women's American or Organization for Rehabilitation through training and perhaps other groups too. We lived in Italy without citizenship of any country for 10 months while we waited for entry visas to the United States. This was a very difficult time for my family. We had to rally on others for our well being. On April 11, 1967, we arrived in New York at Kennedy Airport. The struggles for survival had started all over again. We had little knowledge of the English language, had no income yet, and few skills to help us move ahead. Thanks to Sir Hamily Felt, the groups I mentioned before in our lab of hard work, we overcome and learned a new language, a new culture, and managed to survive. By the way, my husband and I, within 10 years of our arrival in the United States, we were able to repay these organizations for their financial help. I started working in a ladies' clothing store. This forced me to speak English with the customers. After six months of practicing English at work, I felt more confident and was able to get an office job as a payroll secretary in an office. My husband started work for the Hebrew Publishing Company, 
but his job was low paying and had no insurance. My oldest son, Lucian, age 20, was accepted on full scholarship to Yeshiva University. And my daughter, Livia, age 14, started high school. Life in America, our first year was extremely hard. And perhaps if we could have returned to Romania at that time, we might have tried. Perseverance paid off. After the first year, our life improved as our English skill got better. I am so thank you, thankful for all the opportunities this country has provided my family. I cannot imagine living anywhere else and I appreciate getting old in beautiful Florida. For my 70th birthday, I asked my two children to take me on a trip back to Auschwitz. After all, this is my parents' cemetery with no grave and full of very tragic, painful memories. But it is what I really wanted to do. At age 78, I returned to Auschwitz. with two of my grandchildren who wanted to visit the, and learn firsthand about the atrocities that took place in this hellhole. I am blessed with a gold life in a beautiful family. I have two children who are happily married to great spouses. I have five married children and 12 great, great grandchildren. 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 I guess this is my revenge against Hitler and the Nazis. Again, thank you for listening to my story. It was a good ending. I only wish that hatred, violence, and wars in this world would stop. Thank you for listening to me.